Hello survivors and welcome to First Aid Spray, a Resident Evil podcast by fans for fans. This is episode 38, wherein we once more open the Raccoon City chapter of the RE canon, but from the perspective of the Periverse in Book Club, City of the Dead. My name is Cy and joining me on the panel this week, he's Commander Shepard and this is his favourite bookshop in the Citadel of the Dead, or something. It's Firebutton Steve Valance. Wow, hello everybody. <laughs> I'm really struggling this time. <laughs> and our special guest, veteran Resi community member, king of non-canon corner and host of the Resident Evil podcast, and judging by his name, we assume team captain of the Raccoon City Sharks, it's Nick, better known as Neptune. Hello everyone, hi, thanks for uh, inviting me on. This episode of First Aid Spray, like all others, was recorded live in our Discord server. Enter our little world of survival horror now to hear the show early and unedited, as well as join our wonderful community and keep up to date with all of the latest news. You can find the link to the server, as well as all of our other social media profiles, at our website, fasprayPod.com. You can also help the show by checking out our merch, or by supporting us on Patreon for as little as $1 a month with various tiers, each with their own perks. Head over to patreon.com forward slash fasprayPod for a full list and a chance to create bonus first aid spray content. It's been very, very busy the last few weeks for Resident Evil in general and for first aid spray. So it's going to be a top heavy sort of opening part of the show. We've got some rather major announcements that we've been making, so I'll, I'll try and get through the housekeeping uh, as cleanly as possible. So thank you to our most recent patron supporters. Thank you to Ryan Mosby. Thank you to Rainbow Knight Erison. And thank you to Zane Stemple. Thank you to all of you folks and everyone supporting us on Patreon, uh, continuing to do so. We very much appreciate that. Recently, we brought out our Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask episode for Patreon exclusivity. As usual, that comes out a month for Patreons before everyone else. That was a yeah, it was a really fun, different one. It was nice to talk Nintendo, even if it was uh, weird and scary Nintendo. And uh, the latest episode of Now That's What I Call Survival Horror, our series on the Resident Evil soundtracks. This time, all about Code Veronica, where I picked my top ten, is also available for Patreons for a few more weeks before it comes to the public. Speaking of bonus episodes, our Film Club episode on Mortal Kombat is now out for the general public, so scroll back through your feeds if you haven't heard that uh, and you want to hear us discuss the 1995 Mortal Kombat and of course the most recent 2021 film as well. And we've had just a load of stuff in the wake of Village come out on YouTube um, lots of mercenaries guides and uh, things like that. James wrote a wonderful piece on lore analysis and theories, which came out really well. Uh, Steve wrote a video on five crossovers that we'd like to see, which was very well timed to what with Dead by Daylight. And we'll get to that, I'm sure. Uh, so there's been a lot going on content wise. But as I say, we've had some rather major announcements. So uh, let's sort of go um, ascending. Is it ascending or descending? Let's go from smallest to biggest. I never remember what... Anyway. Right, so new merchandise uh, is available now at our store. Go to fasprayPod.com and hit store. Uh, and you can purchase a Rad Vickers t-shirt, mug, notebook, mask, whatever you like, um, with some original artwork from Tips and Art, who you may know from the uh, Resident Evil Twitter community. A wonderful artist uh, with an original piece of Rad Vickers. It's really very cool. I love it. So if you feel like supporting the brand and uh, carrying first aid spray with you wherever you go, perhaps go check that out and our other, does, our other designs as well. Uh, we had a rather major uh, announcement that came together really quick, which is a brand new show. Uh, and the first episode has already happened. Uh, we will be doing weekly Twitch streams that are focused on the Resident Evil board games, of course. <laughs> what else? Um, and it's called Itchy Painty. Uh, Adam and Burger Time are hosting a few hours of a painting stream every week. Uh, the plan is when Resident Evil 3, the board game, arrives uh, for all the Kickstarter backers, they're going to paint through the entire game uh, one miniature at a time, one every week, or at least one um, design every week. Um, but until that comes, at the moment, they're just sort of working on some RE2 stuff as well. So we got some zombie paintings down, and uh, yeah, we'll be going from there. So we look forward to seeing you on Twitch, twitch.tv forward slash Pod every Tuesday. Um, 
There's a post on the website if you want further details about the show, and there's a little YouTube trailer we put together for fun as well. And uh, yeah, there's some there's some cool stuff to look forward to with that as well. I appreciate everyone's support on it so far as well. It's, it's good to add that extra string to our bow. Speaking of adding extra strings, the probably most important thing, and I would have loved to have done this on an episode when he was actually here, but we couldn't make it work. Um, but with a certain person's contributions to First Aid Spray over the last 12 months with video editing, writing, uh, appearing on the podcast and some backstage stuff as well. We elected to make the decision to have Kelsey, uh, Mr. KDB, join the Pueblo people. He's now officially a member of the First Aid Spray team. Uh, to help us with some heavy lifting in terms of content creation and stuff like that. As I say, he's really been helping out a lot backstage anyway, so it just made sense. So welcome aboard, uh, KDB, and we look forward to having you uh, again on the main show, hopefully very soon. First aid spray. You're really becoming a problem for me. Right, that's our mammoth amount of news. Before we get to the Resident Evil news, uh, Nick has been sitting, waiting patiently. So I'm going to circle back round to our guest. Um, uh, Steve and I have been over at the Resident Evil podcast. Uh, so it's nice to have you on finally, uh, Nick. Uh, so first question, of course, your Resident Evil experience. What game was it for you, uh, your first experience? And, and how did you fall in love with the series? Oh, blimey. Uh, it goes back. So um, the first game I ever played was the original Resident Evil. Uh, my, I think Resident Evil 2 had just come out and I, I wasn't I wasn't into it that thing at that time. And my friend sold me Resident Evil 1 for 15 quid. And nice. I, I, I distinctly remember asking him, what's the camera situation like? <laughs> and Because at the time, as I only knew first and third. And he goes, he kind of said... I d- it, it, it's impossible to describe what it is. Mm. It's kind of like fixed in a different angle in each room. And I said, ooh, not sure about that. But yeah, so re- that was the first experience and it absolutely terrified me. <laughs> um, the, it was, and it's, a, it's, it's that feeling I look for in every game coming out, that feeling of not really wanting to play. Yes. That horror element of um, getting to a particular point, knowing your ammo, or lack of, and then not really wanting to go on. And I very distinctly remember just stopping playing when I got to the guardhouse. There's, um, um, I, I was, I was like, I'm done. I'm done. I yeah. can't. The mu, the music, the atmosphere. Um, it was, it was too much. And I stopped for a long, long time uh, until finally going. No, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it and complete it and um, play, play the game. And I, I fell in love with it then. And then I remember a couple of years later get, um, going into uh, what was John Lewis and seeing brand new Resident Evil 3, mm. uh, mistakenly also priced for £15 brand new. And um, <laughs> I was like, oh, blimey, that's cheap. And I said to my dad, 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 can I get it? I think I must have been underage at that point or very close to 15. I was like, dad, dad, can you get it for me? And he's like, not sure, not sure. And he bought it for me. And then... That was it. I was completely yeah. in. The rest completely is in after. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. It's it's so funny because survival horror is such a nondescript term. Like you, there's been arguments since the dawn of the term to now what exactly constitutes survival horror. But you you've hit the nail for me. It's that feeling of like I really want to play this, but also I definitely don't want to play this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and for me, step seven encapsulated that very well. I was like, yes, yeah. That that that, that dread feeling. It's very hard to pinpoint. Um, mm. But yeah, the, the the original trilogy, Co Veronica, and, and and so forth did it so um yeah I've, I've you know been been a fan ever since joined re horror when mm. it was when it was cool um and then obviously i was part of project umbrella and then we set up the podcast and um still natter on to this day yeah very long running podcast Where, what you at eight, <laughs> eight nine years something like that now and no no it'll be it'll be 10 years in january wow uh, so it, it's the longest running i think by about three months i think let's talk resident evil came out in april 2012 <laughs> so uh we, we beat it we beat it by three months but yeah it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's been going far too long um we followed in the footsteps of the rpd dispatch which mm. was the podcast of the horror is alive i don't actually know if they're available any longer i still have them on my pc but they oh. uh, they they were they were old school. Um, yeah, you got a piece of history there because <laughs> I don't think yeah. they are online. I've definitely looked when I've heard you guys talking about it in the past. 
um, and I haven't found, I haven't come across it because I, yeah, I did the, the fan website thing um, way back in the day, bouncing around websites like that, and then yeah, discovering uh, REP set obviously many years ago now, coming in sort of halfway through your lifespan. So it's it's cool as well because um, you know, as you say, you're nearly ten years, but within the last few, I feel like there's been a, a big build. Obviously, it's nice to see some of the longer running. Um, Resident Evil communities coming to Discord and stuff like that, which is and Patreon and everything else. It's it's been nice to see like a, a big ramping up of growth in the last couple of years, especially with you getting your own website and everything like that. Mm, yeah, we've been uh, busy, and obviously John's been doing his timeline. Uh, right, yeah, it's internet celebrity, is... the Batman. <laughs> yeah, he's been working far too hard on that, but yeah, mm. it's, it's been nice, you know, and you know, it's. Um... You know, it's, it, like like you guys, really, it's is it, it's kind of like a genuine friendship that's evolved over the years, which is um, probably yeah. one of the reasons why we're still going. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. One day well, that'll be us going. Oh God, how do we get to ten years? <laughs> All right. Well, uh, let's rock on then into a rather hefty version of the Biohazard News. No news stories this week. We're fine. Let's roll. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> so our first article, uh, Netflix have announced the principal cast for the new live-action Resident Evil series. Oh, this is a, this is a hell of a thing, isn't it? Um, breaking I, I didn't see anything. I didn't see anything on Twitter about this. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this just came out yesterday, as of the time of recording. Um, kind of a stealth drop, you know, part of the Netflix geeked... Um, week that they're doing as part of sort of in tandem with everything going on with e3 this week um they've been doing like daily streams announcing various details and they had a very video game focused day and i i I just watched it because you know i'm interested in some of the shows they're talking about i really didn't actually expect them to drop too much especially um not this show which of course shouldn't be confused with infinite darkness which we'll be talking about shortly and shouldn't be confused with a live action film this is yet another project um this is we talked about it in the news before this is the quote-unquote wesker kids uh, situation. Um, so we have uh, the cast here and some vague ideas of what's going on. So straight out of the gate, we already know uh, Lance Reddick is playing Albert Wesker. Uh, Lance Reddick is, I mean, to be fair to this, despite some of the nasty uh, hot takes, I've seen a lot of people saying, well, he's an amazing actor. Uh, and I agree. Um, and he'll make a great Wesker, I think. You might know him from Fringe, uh, The Wire. Uh, for me personally, he's in the Horizon series, which is just funny to think, you know, those two major franchises that I love so much have now got something in common like that. Uh, and he's going to be joined by, and I hope I pronounce all of these names correctly, uh, Ella Balaniska, Tamara Smart, Sienna Abudong, and Asline Rudolph, and Paula Nunez. Uh, and there's a couple of pictures of them. Um, and looking at that picture, since we know that the plot synopsis is about Jade and Billy Wesker... Uh, as 14-year-olds and 30-year-olds or whatever they're going to be, it's pretty clear to me that the girls on the left are one character, the girls on the right are one character, uh, sort of at different ages. So it very much seems that that is, the, that is definitely the direction we're heading. Um, Nick, what's your immediate reaction to this? Oh, um, I, 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 I go into it with a very... I, I'll see see how it goes see how mm-hmm. it goes i have very little interest in um the in the, the new live action i mean i i've had the privilege if you want to call it that of reading a draft s- script slash oh, synopsis dear. of it um it doesn't sound particularly good but you never know you know it's i, I think because it's so far um so far removed from the source material then ju- they they should uh, and you know, just do what they like with it, and just mm. let rip and ha- have fun, you know. And ho- hopefully, um, you know, make a good storyline. My issue will be uh, more so about the kind of more, I say, casual fan, but someone who's just picking this up. Uh, if they're on Netflix, they're going to be com- potentially confused as to whether it ties into Infinite Darkness, which will still be relatively fresh. Mm. Will it tie into the new reboot movie, which is in November? Um, and I actually think the answer is it semi ties into the Anderson verse. 
uh, I which makes that. it even more confusing. Mm, <laughs> I know how many how many of these do we need? I, I completely agree. Um, I, I'm I'm trying to be open minded. It is kind of difficult, I'll be honest. But I'm trying not to be hypocritical. I'm going to try and enjoy this for what it is. But you're right; it's its own thing. So it, that makes it a little bit easier. Like it's it's clearly not associated with any of the other canons. There's there's no way this can be associated with the game canon. Um, so I'm okay with that <laughs> for one thing. I think we're still, I, I guess, assuming a 2021 release date, but I don't think that's, that can be right. Um, especially because, yeah, the production slate of Resident Evil, that's just going to make everything very confusing. And just from the fact they've shown these pictures, they're not in costume or anything like that. It's just an actor reveal. Uh, I honestly wouldn't be surprised if they haven't started filming or anything yet. I don't know either way, personally. Maybe there's information out there, either way or the other. But to me, it feels like this is... You know, they haven't really en- actually entered production properly at this point. So could be a, a way off yet. Um, yeah, well, I suppose we'll have to see what happens. Steve, what are your thoughts on this? You know, prior to this news, I'd completely blocked from my mind there was even going to be a Jade <laughs> and Billy Wesker spin-off. Um, to be fair, this is... It's not so much the news itself, but the reaction, some people's reaction, not the, the stupid negative ones, but the ones that have reacted to this... Uh, what's his name? Lance Reddick? Yes, um, their reaction to them and them being such a quality actor has actually kind of got me intrigued enough to, you know, I was going to give it a go anyway because we're on a Resident Evil podcast. It would be remiss not to. But now I'm kind of looking forward to it because everyone's hyping this dude up for me. So hopefully mm. that pays off. Uh, you know, I'm uh, in a slightly more positive p- position than I was before, I guess. Uh, again, you know, I just hear the words Jade and Billy Wesker and the part of me dies a bit inside. But that's, uh, that's <laughs> yeah. by the by, really, I guess. Yeah, I, um, there's a, uh... I don't want to. I don't want to be mean or anything, but there is a part of me that feels a little bit sad for him that he's uh, going to be sort of attached to this project because I think he. I do think he'll make a good Wesker. He's got like a a slimy business suited kind of bad guyness to him. He's played roles like that uh, that I've seen that I've really enjoyed. Um, he was really good in stuff like Quantum Break and, as I say, Horizon and. Um, yeah, he can play a, a decent bad guy, um, kind of like a sassy sort of smarmy dude. But he, yeah, he might be the bright spot in this. Who, who can say? Maybe this will blow us all out of the water. Maybe amazing. That'd be great. Yeah, I, I yeah. Don't know. you gotta, you gotta, you gotta try these things before they, you know. Sink. Absolutely. <laughs> so, our uh, next bit of news is that Resident Evil Infinite Darkness's final trailer and opening scene have been revealed, and the show releases on July the eighth. Yeah, uh, out of nowhere, I guess. Very, very soon. Um, so that's quite exciting. Uh, the trailer for me doesn't show... I mean, there's some cool stuff in there, but it doesn't tell us necessarily too much about what to expect that we didn't know from the, the synopsis that we'd already seen online. I uh, got a couple of looks at some characters. Um, Jason, I think his name is, the, uh, the sort of military dude that I think Leon's teaming up with. We got a look at President Graham, which is nice briefly. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty excited for this. Uh, I don't know if this is official or anything, but reports are saying it's... It, I think it's a four-episode run. No idea what the le- length of that's going to be, but, I mean, if it's successful, who knows? Could be more to this. Nep, what are your thoughts on Infinite Darkness so far? Excited? Yeah, I mean, I think I've heard it's 25-minute episodes. Four okay. episodes of 25 minutes, um, which possibly suggests that it was a movie at one point. Mm. Maybe, maybe, who knows? Um, I th- we've, we've discussed this as well, and... The concern is retrospective or retroactive, should we say? Retrospective Intercals. storytelling. Mm. Uh, yeah, they, they they can be difficult, and we, we've seen that a bit in Village, um, with you know adding things in retrospectively, and you go, oh yeah, that's cool. And then when you stop and think about it, you go, does, does it does it really work? So, for Infinite Darkness, the concern really is uh, more to do with the fact that could we be getting another Terra Grigia type incident as seen in Revelations where we have the seemingly massive event mm. that is never referenced again um, and that it, it makes the future sequels seem a bit odd that it's not mentioned so you know for example yeah. in the in Resident Evil 5 Terra Grigia is not mentioned despite the fact that that outbreak went on for three weeks straight uh, we had a woman James Bond-esque a satellite destroy city you know totally on par with um with raccoon city and it's just doesn't you know it barely get bat as an eyelid so from what we've seen in infinite darkness is 
basically, you know, the president be attacked, Leon being incompetent at his job again in looking <laughs> after presidents, and um, you know, the most important house in the world in under a biohazard outbreak mm. that has not been mentioned since. It's the it's the inherent nature of an integral, if you want to call it that, but it it can leave a sour taste in 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 one's mouth if it's not handled in a correct manner. So I would hope that it's done and all kind of covered up, kept on the QT in order to kind of justify the future storytelling. Um, that's why it's not mentioned in uh, Resident Evil Six and yeah. Seven and all sorts. But you know, it, it's probably not going to happen. But that that's that's the problems that could that, that, that could arise as a result um there's plenty of hopes you know it's the year i think um blue umbrella were formed um so you know the, the optimist in me would like to see it linked in with that perhaps it's a blue umbrella attack or um the start of that who knows but otherwise yeah i'm quite excited it's good to see more cgi but i i've enjoyed them all for what they're worth mm. um so uh, yeah quite looking forward to it yeah i think it's um this is one of those things where it's just like I'm glad they're making more content like that, despite, you know, mi I have mixed feelings all round on the on the three films. Some I like more than others, some are, you know, like less than others. But I'm glad they're continuing to explore that kind of thing. Um, I completely agree about the canon. They're, they're, hopefully they're, they're careful about it, but we have seen in the past, as you said, that maybe not so much, as long as it's not, like, rip roaringly ridiculous, um, maybe maybe we'll just be able to sort of look past it and get away with it uh steve mm. thoughts on the infinite darkness trailer honestly uh i'm kind of worried like like people have said that people um you know it feels like it could be a film that's been chopped up and those films have pacing issues across the board for me so the fact that they've, if they took a film that's got so we say if it's to the standard of the other films if it's got those kind of pacing issues throughout and then chopped it into four kind of makes me a bit nervous but the the little clip they showed, get, like very strong, like flashbacks to Black Hawk Down and yeah. Resident Evil Five. Yeah. Um, overall, I'm I'm kind of looking forward to seeing how uh, Matt Mercer and Nick Apostolidis bounce off each other because you know two Leons in one room's got to be funny. <laughs> and Let's uh, yeah, not like, forget like, Claire in glasses as well. By the way, I just wanted yeah. to make sure we didn't <laughs> overlook that. <laughs> but yeah, like. Like Nick said, the, the, if if they're going to start like throwing canonical things around, like cause I'm not, not trying to funny, if they do have a biohazard attack that's that successful and levels the White House, it should be an earth shattering deal for the Res universe. Not something that yep. gets swept under the rug. Mm. Um, so yeah, I kind of hope that there's more going on. That the the artwork is kind of portraying a theme, not necessarily what's happening. So mm. yeah, I'm going to watch it. Looking forward to it for the fact that it's a Resident Evil canonical. I think. Entry, mm. but otherwise, gonna wait and see. You know, see what see what it tastes like. See what the proof of the pudding is. You know yeah. that kind of thing. Because yeah, no, you're it, so it, right. I know I'm very, I'm very much a fence sitter for the live action stuff and the CGI stuff. I apologise, everybody. I think you know prior experiences uh, kind of inform that. So that's fair. Yeah. <laughs> I th but you know what? Though? You've said said a great thing as well. Like, you're so right. You know, we've just had Village, and now we've got another. Assume we have we have to assume uh, canonical story, which is nice because obviously we haven't had anything before then for a very long time, really. So to have two back to back new stories uh, is pretty cool. I wonder if there'll be another post credit sting that barely means anything or doesn't factor in at all. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Our next bit of news: uh, Dead by Daylight cross Resident Evil. Ch uh, the chapter has been announced and is going to be releasing on June fifteenth. Yeah, just a few days. Uh, after we record this episode, I'm, I'm very excited to pick it up and have a try. Um, Steve, I don't, oh, you haven't had a chance to play the game, as far as I'm aware, have you? Uh, Nick, have you ever played DVD? I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I, no, I, I do, I do. I, 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 I don't play such things. No, you'll be lucky. To, you'll be lucky to get me out of a, a, a 3D platform in Resident Evil. That's about as far as I go. Uh, even, even if it has got the uh, the Resident Evil branding on it. That's fair um, enough. Well, isn't it? The, um, it's not. It's not. It's not the uh, four. But the four v one thing. It is. Yeah. Uh, oh, is it? It's like the Silent, the Silent Hill crossover that happened. Is that yes, the same it's the, that? it's now crossing over to the game that Silent Hill was also crossed over into. It's it's the game that uh, right, okay. uh, Resistance has definitely taken some of the cues from. It's kind of like the the bigger one of that genre, four versus one genre. Well, as Resistance sits very much bottom of my list of games, um, I will not. <laughs> I will not be enduring uh, a four v one, even if it's a masterful four by one. So uh, I'm afraid 
my contribution to this new segment is uh, nominal. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I have played DVD a little bit. I picked it up um, <clears throat> just after the reveal, actually, but not necessarily just because of the Resident Evil thing, but there's a lot of people on our Discord server that play the game, and I was looking for something to play with them. And, um, yeah, we've had a good time with it. You know, it's it's, it's a fairly well-built game, so I'm interested to see how they handle the Resident Evil stuff. I did a breakdown video on it, so I suppose I don't necessarily need to go into my own thoughts on it too much, but they seem to have done a very good job in terms of uh, laying on the love of the series, you know, the map looks great, the characters and their skills look great and make sense. You've got the, you know, just small stuff like the item chest being, uh, replacing the standard chest from DVD. You get the Resident Evil item chest instead. You get zombies, you know. It's, it looks pretty neat, so I'm excited to try it out. Steve, is this going to convince you to pick the game up? You know, if not that, it will be the peer pressure from the Discord server, because I know you're all <laughs> playing it. Um, <laughs> I want to shout out the things that I've seen on Twitter, though, because it looks like they really have gone to town. Like, a lot of people were a bit disappointed in Silent Hill's representation of Heather Mason, in mm. that it doesn't look kind of anywhere near her original portrayal in Silent Hill 3. But no. uh, for the Resident Evil the Resident Evil 2 and 3 characters, respectively, they all look fairly bang on. to the, They're not quite the same, but they're close enough. Like, we're talking 95-ish mm. percent to their remake counterparts, which I think is solid. Um Gameplay wise, I've watched a few people play it. Nemesis looks fun. I I, uh, I would probably play Killer rather than I would play Survivor, but that's because I'm mean and I like to bully people. <laughs> <laughs> I had the two. I actually I do tend to swing more in the direction of playing uh, Killer if I'm playing by myself. That's a good fun time. So I'm I'm excited to try out sort of Nemesis's mood set. But yeah, it's it, yeah should be good. Looks it looks decent. It's it's cool to see the RPD. Uh, sort of built up in a completely different engine. It's weird, but uh, it's also kind of funny that this is going to ar- <laughs> arrive before our v- our reverse. So that's uh... yeah. I was gonna I was gonna mention that because it felt like while I was watching people play, I thought, is this just the our reverse map? And then no, they've actually rebuilt something themselves, uh, mm-hmm. which is impressive. You know, fair play to the DBD guys. You know, it can't be easy to replicate something like that. I'd imagine with different engine and all that. Mm. Um, yeah. Isn't there? I, I'm not not trying to stoke rumors, but is it is it is it generally there's more characters maybe as skins, or is that still like? Uh, we won't. I don't think we'll know until it's out uh, in a few days. That um, it has been done um, with the Silent Hill one, with Stranger Things and stuff. Um, the cosmetics for the for certain characters are actually other characters from the series, so it's certainly possible. Um, again, it's just as likely though that it being Leon and Jill that they've got plenty of outfits that you can pick from you know you could definitely put leon in a re4 jacket and put jill in the stars uniform 100 percent. so i don't know what remains to be seen uh, we'll, we'll find out in literally three days so yeah interesting i want i want leon in his re2 remake windbreaker of you know dawson's creek you know <laughs> those sneakers and jeans i may or not be easily pleased <laughs> so our last bit of news, uh, Peter Fabiano has left Capcom after a 13-year career. Yeah, I, was, uh, yeah, I think it's, it, we should at least acknowledge it, um, because that's a hell of a long time. Um, starting out as Resident Evil 5's uh, lead localization guy, I think is correct, and then um, winding up starring in RE7 as Peter Walken, as the, uh, the face and I think probably the voice as well, um, and then being a producer on the, on some of the more recent games. So, you know, good for him. He's come under a lot of flack over the last few years, um, which is a shame. But uh, interesting. Interesting that he's, you know, jumping over to Bungie now. What, what You know, who's going to fill that spot? So, uh, he's he's ascended up the ranks to sort of... I think he's head of global R&D was his technical title, which is quite a, quite a big seat to fill. So... Mm. Steve, what do you reckon? Uh, best of luck to him. Like, mm. I appreciate all he's done, but uh, from what I understand, Destiny is in a bit of a rough spot right now, so I wish him the best of luck, and I hope he can do what he did for Resident Evil to that and kind of get it back into a uh, more ship-shaped condition. Like, you know, I have, I have nothing against the man, to be fair. I think uh, I just wish him well. Yeah, I think that's a nice positive way to look at it because where I, that's, you know, you thought that way, I looked at it and went, and you thought you got some mean tweets from the Resident Evil community. I imagine that <laughs> working on Destiny, I see a lot of people saying horrible yeah. things about that game. So, uh, yeah, that's a, all the best. Braver man than I. <laughs> absolutely, yeah. Nick, what do you reckon on this one? 
I, I, I think he'll leave an interesting legacy, mm. um, and it is pure, purely down to his um, view on the canon. Yes. Um, but it, it's not a negative thing. It's, it's one of those things that I think a lot of fans of you know of the Western world are have a very different mindset about what what is canon. And so when um, he was asked about remake two, remake three. And all, but all being in the in, in the same universe, people did not gel with that at all because you know I, I made a video I think ages ago about listing hundreds of things in Resident Evil Three Remake. What can't possibly work? You know, did Jill do this? Did she go there? Blah blah. You know, mm. and what's interesting that we've kind of picked up on over the past couple of years is that the the Japanese culture of these type of things is just not as important as it is in for kind of Western fans, if you like. Right. Um, you know, take, for example, I think, cause I think we, uh, when I spoke with Alex CVX freak, he was talking about the, uh, the boarded up, um, rooms in Rima, in Resident Evil three, which obviously aren't there in Resident Evil two. And in Japan, it's just considered it, it's there because it needs to be for story purposes. Jill isn't supposed to go to those parts of the RPD. So they just put up some, you know, a barrier to prevent that from happening. Now, we as fans will dig deep into go, well, why is that there? You know, did Brian Irons go around ripping them down? And, you know, and, and there's all sorts of things you can kind of come up with and demand. But in for most, for seemingly, you know, I'm taking this from first-hand accounts from, you know, from Alex and stuff, is that the, the Japanese fans just don't, I don't say care. It just it just doesn't matter as much. It's not as important as, as much. So when Fabiano said that, yeah, it all happens at the same time, uh, between remake two, remake three, and the originals, for us, it, it, we struggled with that concept for the the obvious reasons. Um, how you know, did did she go by tram or did she go by subway? She can't have gone by both. It doesn't matter. Mm. Um, now, whether that's uh, a sustainable approach going forward, I don't know, and I think that will be the long term legacy Fabiano leaves if that approach is being very much adopted going forward. Um, with any future games, um, you know, arguably Brandon Bailey as the leader of the connections does not work if you stop and think about it. I mean, he's dead in 2006. Mm. Um, so what was the point? There's no point. Are you going to suddenly bring him back? You know, they just picked a name because they liked it. Does it matter to most people? Okay, maybe. But it, it's so hard. And I, I think Fabiano's legacy will be determined at a later date. Um, with, yes. with future projects, that's fair. That's just that's me. But you know, he's a really nice guy, isn't he? He's very, very enthusiastic mm. with these uh, press events, and he, you could see he liked to get involved with them. Um, so yeah, and you know, he's left the series much healthier than it was when he started. To put it that way. Yeah, absolutely. It'll be interesting to see, as you say, whether that sort of approach continues. Um, if that's been ingrained in people, perhaps uh, working under him, who might ascend to mm. that. Or if we're going to go a completely different direction or not with it, um, but yeah, the future the future looks a little bit brighter, um, and he had a hand in that, so that's good. You know, think of where we were many years ago. So, uh, props yeah. props for his contribution to that. And now, reading excerpts from S. D. Perry's Resident Evil: City of the Dead, Mike Martin, who you can follow on Twitter at at Evil Deadites. Leon raised the magnum and aimed it the closest, the man with the suspenders, while his instinct screamed at him to run. He was terrified, but his trained logic continued to insist that there was an explanation for what he was seeing, that he was not looking at the walking dead. Control, procedure, you're a cop. All right, that's far enough. Don't move. His voice was strong, commanding and authoritative. And he was wearing his uniform, and God, why wouldn't they stop? The man in suspenders moaned again, blind to the weapon pointed at his chest, and still flanked by the others, now less than ten feet away. Don't move, Leon said again, and the sound of his own panic made him back up a step, darting his gaze left and right, seeing that there was still more of the wailing, lurching people coming out of the shadows. Something grabbed his ankle. No, he shouted, whip the gun around saw that the corpse of the hit-and-run victim was scrabbling at his boot with one blood-crusted hand, working to drag her crippled body closer. Her grasping cry of frantic hunger rose to join those of the others 
as she tried to bite into his foot, bloody smears of saliva drooling off her abraded chin, dripping onto the leather. Leon fired into her upper back, the sharp, explosive crack of the massive weapon loosening her grip and at such close range, probably obliterating her heart. Spasming, she dropped back to the pavement. And he turned and saw the others were less than five feet away, and he fired twice more, the round splattering red flowers into the chest of the closest. The entry wound spouted scarlet. The man in suspenders was hardly phased by the twin gaping holes in his torso, his stagger faltering only for a second. He opened his bloody mouth and gasped out a hissing mule of hunger, hands raised again as if to direct him to the source of relief. So it is Book Club, episode three, City of the Dead, the Resident Evil 2 adaption. Um, Yet another S.D. Perry novel from her original contract, which I think in earlier episodes I've said was a three book deal. But now having done uh, another round of looking for more information and interviews and stuff she's done, uh, perhaps it was a four book deal when I was wrong. So uh, either way, this is the third book, part of her original contract. Um, and it was first published. And again, this is the, the, the case with the internet and some of this earlier stuff. Some places say it was first published in May 99. Some places say it was first published in August 99. Um, and then it was re-released in September 2012. So um, fairly originally, fairly uh, soon after the, the, the game. Not uh, you know immediately afterwards, but you know within a, a year or so. Um Let's start with our history with the book, um, and in Nick's case, your history with the series. Um, what was the first book with of S.D. Perry's Resident Evil novels that you picked up? Was it the first one, or where did you jump in? Yeah, so my first was The Umbrella Conspiracy. I remember um, when I kind of joined the, the early part of the fandom, people obviously talking about them. I think at that point, Code Veronica was, had just been released. Oh, right. Um, so I think I was at that point, or very, very close to it. And um, it, it, it was getting bashed. I think a lot of them, you know, a lot of people didn't like them at all. And um, I remember discovering a small website called Amazon. And um, <laughs> going, oh, look, they're available here. And I, I just kind of asked for them all for Christmas. And I remember um, just having a huge pile of books. And I've got like all uh, five of them at the time. Mm. And so I just got kind of to cr- cracked on with them simultaneously, uh, in 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 order. Nice. And uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, start with one, and then did Caliban, and then City of the Dead, and stuff. And so yeah, binge and then reading. Zero came- I mean, yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I remember when Zero came out. I guess that was her last one, wasn't it? Zero. Mm. And I just distinctly remember that getting that one uh, when it came out. So yeah, I've, uh, I've I've had them, and I'm pleased I've get kept them actually because I, I like a lot of fans. At one point, I had a big merchandise purge uh, much to my regret um mm. and for some inexplicable reason these survived i don't know what i don't know why i i didn't sell them um when i sold great things like the gamecube chainsaw controller oh. um, and and some cool limited edition uh hunk no no limited edition leon action figure that sold but i i, I kept all of the books and uh, i'm really pleased i have um because it's all the i've got all the original covers which are a billion mm. times better than yeah. the uh, well, yeah the we'll, we'll get to that I, I, we <laughs> say the same thing every time and i'm sure we always will but we'll get to that <laughs> Um, yeah, for me, as I've said on previous ones, I haven't read a whole lot of the series. Um, <clears throat> City of the Dead was one that I did get to read, though, and this is a, this is an ancient thing. Um, I was in a library once. Uh, I remember those, and I they would always have those computers at libraries where you could basically just search out what stock they had uh, and potentially order stock from a nearby library. Uh, so if you were looking for a very specific book. Um, and my interests were very specific. I wasn't really that bothered about reading uh, books that were just books. I was like, oh, I want to read about things I already like. So I'd probably just go in there and just like bash Ghostbusters into the search bar and see what came up. Uh, and I did it for Resident Evil once, clearly. And City of the Dead came up. And I was probably very excited because I knew Resident Evil 2 very well. I don't know how old I was, but I definitely at least played Resident Evil 2. Uh, so yeah, I rented that. I don't know if I got through the whole thing. But I definitely remember... Uh, taking a library version of City of the Dead home to read uh, one time in the in the distant past. Steve, what was your experience with City of the Dead? Pretty much the same as last time we talked about the books. I got them all like in a big mm. sleeping like set while I was at college, and it was a 
a you know, all right, I've finished Ca- uh, Caliban Cove. Straight to see the dead. Uh, yeah. Yeah, just, just plow through them. You know, who does coursework and all these other important things while you're at college? Nah, read Resident Evil books, fam. Um, <laughs> uh, essentially, essentially it. It's, it's not very deep, but, you know, when, when you start one episode, you have to then go on to the next. Uh, yeah, had a good time. Nice. Okay, well, as alluded to, let's start with judging a book by its cover rather than talking about the contents of it, and let's talk about the artwork of the book. Um, and as alluded to, no questions asked, at least on my end, what I like out of them. Um, I've dropped three that I've come across uh, on Google Image Search. Uh, if you look for City of the Dead Resident Evil, you should find all of these. The original 99 one, which is sort of a follow-on from what you'd expect. Um Leon and Claire, sort of original drawing of them. And it actually, I like this one a lot because it's very much a throwback to Umbrella Conspiracy with Chris and Jill standing in front of the mansion and some uh, monsters sort of hanging overhead. This time in the fire, you've got Licker, uh, the female zombie, and Birkin, which is... I can go either way with that one. I feel like maybe it should have been the tyrant out of the two, but we'll, we'll get to why I think that later, I'm sure. Um, and yeah, the, the 2012 one's just the same same thing you'd exp- as all the rest. It's part of sort of like this very uniform series, just a couple of zombies hanging out. And there's uh, some original artwork for the Japanese release, which I think was released in uh, really not that long ago, to be honest. I think it was like 2013, 2015, something like that, of uh, Leon trudging through the sewer. Um Nick, any interest in... I know, as you say, you don't like the reprint. What do you think of the Japanese one, and what do you think of the original, of course? Uh, Starting with the original, yeah, I like it. I mean, yeah, it's a bit of a uh, 90s Photoshop, isn't it, with the (laughs) original... (laughs) um, With the original uh, B.O.W.'s put into it. But I I like it. What what I like about it most is... uh, It's consistent, as you said, consistent with Umbrella Chronicle... um, uh, Umbrella Conspiracy, and it works with the future titles as well. Um, what I also like about it is that it matches the Biohazard 2 audio dramas and that artwork they released. There's quite a similar sort of vibe going on with oh, them, yeah. that kind of orangey, flamey red colours mm. um, that they that they did. And so I, I think it works quite well um, with, with, with that. I, I, I just don't know what's going on with the 2012 one. That is, it's awful, is it? Yeah. What game is that from? It's from... Um, I actually have well, no I, idea. Is it Umbrella Chronicles, maybe, or something? I think I think it might mm. be, or Dark, mm. maybe even Dark Side. I, I was it, what are they standing? It looks like a looks like they're in a blooming World War One trench, doesn't it? <laughs> it oh, really oh. does, you know. <laughs> it's, know ab- it's abysmal, isn't it? It really is. Like it's, you couldn't even put Leon and Claire, just some generic zombies. It's, it's very ugh. yeah. I I don't like yeah, and and the Japanese one, I, I I like that a lot actually. That 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 does give the the impression of the kind of dankness. I've, I've not seen that one before, actually. So that's quite um, that's quite cool. Um, also, just because um, for my guest appearance here, the what I like about the originals is that if you were in Germany, the books carried on beyond Code Veronica. Um, oh, right. Not not by well, kind of not by S. D. Perry, um, but the oh, blimey uh, in, into into the Liberty book and i think blank rose which is a fan book um both of them fo- follow on the number sequence of their books seven and eight. Oh right i didn't know that uh yeah they're, they're not related at all mm. um but they they get the same sort of that, that kind of you know the nice cool uh bio has a triangle in the corner with the numbers mm. um <laughs> so, yeah so they carry on so if if you if you pick them up you can you almost have like a, a slightly elongated version of the of the collection but they're not by perry they're by other people but mm. um i always thought that was a, a missed opportunity from um from the if, to have it translated and then carried on in that same manner this is the great advantage of having you on, Nick, is that we get some really, like, deep, hidden stuff like that that, you know, we wouldn't necessarily bring up before. Those books, I know about them. I had no idea something like that, um, you know, that they were printed that way. They're, they're the mm. fan-written books that won a competition, for those of you who don't know. They the, they won a Capcom competition to have their, their fan writings printed, something like that, right, wasn't it? Yes, yeah, yeah, that's right. I can't remember. Wild. Blank Rose, de- yeah, Blank Rose, definitely. I uh, can't remember Into the Liberty. Um, I think it they're, was. They're... I think both the same sort of thing. Mm, mm. They're not considered. Uh, they're, I don't know what another universe. They're, mm. they're not considered. Um, can just a fan-made uh, reward, if you like. Yeah, um, that they did, but 
Um, yeah, if, if, if you're if you're German, and uh, you, you probably would have books seven and eight. <laughs> uh, Steve, what do you think of the overall swath of covers there? Well, like everyone's already said, I think, you know, in consistent tone with the Umbrella Conspiracies cover, City of the Dead's original print cover looks fantastic. Mm. Admittedly, I would like to have seen a giant, almost like gargantuan Godzilla-esque liquor. However, we will ignore the scale. It just looks <laughs> it looks, looks pretty good, contrasting against the rest of the covers. It's, you know, I would argue the most accurate into the, they're in a, uh, you know, it's Leon and Claire amidst the chaos. Yeah. The reprint cover, I'm pretty sure... Anyone on Earth with Photoshop could achieve better. Uh, everyone's seeing trenches. I'm just seeing we've gone to plaid from space balls along the sides of the corridors with two. Uh, <laughs> they look like umbrella core zombies. Uh, yeah, the, the, the standout takeaway for me though is the Japanese cover. That looks fantastic. It almost looks like you could put Leon in Aliens or something. <laughs> uh, I'm, I can't stop looking at it. It's just like mm, I would watch. I would watch a show with this kind of art style. You know, like. Leon esque in almost reminds me of Berserk in a way. I don't mm. know why. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a v- very uh, on tone style. It's a strange thing to choose though. Leon like having been shot and limping through a sewer. But it, yeah, I don't know. It just works. I like it. I like it a lot. Uh, if I had to put a pin on which one I like the most, it's the Japanese one, followed by the uh, original cover. And then you know, can we get some children to draw up some sketches to put in between? <laughs> Because City of the Dead's like re- redo cover. Je- Jesus, that's phoned it. I'm sorry, I'm offended by it. It's just <laughs> awful. Like they're all bad, God. but this is. Oh yeah, I think this is. Definitely it's not the worst even got one. Leon and Claire on it. I know. Like, terrible. It's isn't just it? really terrible. Some zombie lady and some zombie dude going. Uh, I, uh, missed opportunity. <laughs> Missed well, opportunity. Let's uh, let's pull the book open then. Let's talk about the contents of what I think is probably the longest book in the series. Um, it's definitely the longest book so far by a wide margin. I actually checked. Caliban Cove has something like two hundred and twenty something pages, I think, whereas this is three hundred and twenty something. It's an extra third as long, basically, um, which is quite interesting. Um, let's talk about, I know this is a rather a, a broad one, but basically the story, not necessarily so much as um, sort of comparing it to the video game uh, and adaption. I'm, I'm sure that, of course, that has to come up. But just sort of how S.T. Perry handles the story of, of as everyone knows, Leon and Claire arriving in an infected Raccoon City, um, overrun with zombies, coming across fan favourite characters like Sherry, Ada, uh, Irons, Ben, and so on. It's 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 pretty much all in here. I mean, that's my first point: is that this is, um, despite being really long, I, there is kind of like no extra fluff. Maybe a couple of chapters, perhaps, were unnecessary, but I didn't hate any of it. It did none of it felt like it was dragging for me. Uh, there were parts where I was kind of like. You know, maybe it would have been nice to have a little more time in the RPD. It feels a little bit fleeting in the grand scheme. And it would have been nice to have the scene where um, Leon and Claire catch up in the RPD in the star's office or in the the hallway outside the library. Uh, But in the same vein, I understand why that's not there, because it it doesn't really add too much to the narrative and the book's going to be long enough as it is. So, yeah, I think it's it's everything that it needs to be in terms of telling the story. Um, Nep, how do you feel about this uh, from a story perspective? Yeah, so I've I've not read the book for such a long time, so um, I, I couldn't remember any of it really. So going back to read it was was refreshing um, and almost like a new experience. I mean, it, it's Leon A, Claire B. Yes, um, if anyone uh, was unaware, um, so you kind of get that story. But she does um, a good job, I think, in 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 telling everything bar say Sherry's infection storyline. That's mm-hmm. uh, that's omitted, but of course that's omitted in in. Uh, Claire B. Anyway, right. So, it's. It, I, I thought it was extremely faithful. Um, on on the whole, I thought it uh, the the interactions were good and uh, it moved along as you said at quite a very good pace. Um, as someone, if anyone knows me, knows I read a lot of Star Wars books and Star Wars mm. novelizations. And um, if anyone's ever read the Force Awakens novelization, that moves along at a nice, uh, kind of like a quite a slow pace. And then basically the last half an hour of the film is dealt with in like 
10 pages or something it's just <laughs> suddenly it's like oh my god i've got to finish it you know mm. um and it, it, it leaves a sour taste in the mouth with that with that adaptation this one i felt all the points were covered in a, in a right in, in in the in the correct order um and it, it never dragged and um you know i i didn't feel it was rushed or anything like that and um it, it I don't know. I, I, I was I was pleasantly surprised at the. Mm. I think we'll talk about the kind of characterizations a bit more. Yeah. But um, I, I think it kind of covered everything, and um, I was I was very pleased with with it. I wonder if it was. Uh, I mean, at this point, with the game having been brand new, you know, we don't know E, and we still kind of will argue about A and B and stuff like that. You know, we don't didn't mm. know any implications. I don't know if it was an intentional you'd think that she'd rather do it this way maybe she didn't know perhaps that it was the other way around um she said before in interviews that she writes them based on playing the game over and over again and at times recording uh, a playthrough of the game and watching it back um probably easier to sort of like transpose the dialogue into the book that way when you can just pause and, and play it and stuff um <clears throat> that being said either she really wanted to put claire in jeopardy or her claire playthrough was uh off very much on hard mode because uh she misses the bow gun and the grenade launchers you know she winds up with two handguns and that's all she's got whereas leon starts the book with a desert eagle <laughs> yeah. he gets a shotgun before he encounters anything other than a zombie you know <laughs> someone's playing on hard and someone's playing on easy in this one that's for sure <laughs> steve what do you think of the uh adaption of the story well not the adaption of the story but the story itself you were a few minor, like, you know, shoves to the side and like um, continuity issues. I think it's decent, uh, very much like more in line with the game than, you know, than the Umbrella Conspiracy was. And that wasn't exactly terrible for it. Like, you know, people having overpowered guns and some people having like access to infinite item boxes like Ada, who can just carry everything she needs. <laughs> Aside, I feel like if you'd have, re if you have wrenched the, uh, the acknowledgement of Trent from the story, this would have been the closest a game to book adaption for the era would yes, have been. Uh, I was pleasantly surprised. And like Nick said regarding pacing, I read this a few times in preparation for the podcast and then I did it again in the past three days and i just couldn't put it down so it's, it's been, yeah that's probably a good sign i think nice um i would I say think... by the way if you sorry to interrupt if you substitute the word trent for wesker it would be fun seriously though because I, I i mentally did that because uh you know tr trent's a funny character but replace replace the word trent with wesker and it's it's a hun almost 100 percent accurate bar nice. the epilogue with david trapp you know, mm -hmm. apart, you know, it, it works surprisingly well when Ada's yeah. going. I wonder, I wonder who Trent is. I want, you know, how did he know about the the mansion incident and things like that? Replace it with Wesker, and you go, yeah, it makes perfect sense. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, Going to throw my hat into a ring as to why it's probably Leon A and Claire B. Disc one was Leon. Disc yeah. two was Claire. Yeah, yeah, that, that's probably certainly. why. Yeah, there is an omitted scene I'm kind of gutted about in that, that Sherry gets, like, zero closure on both of her parents because she doesn't see what happens to Annette or mm. William. Not really. Mm -hmm. um, I suppose that's more of a character thing. Um, yeah, no, no, honestly, the story as a whole was fine. You know, enough for me to read through it multiple times, which, spoiler, so far, I have not read each book multiple times in preparation for the podcast. I've read them once in preparation for the podcast. So that, that's, that's something, right? That is something, especially or, since it's... It's such a chunky book, you know, compared to the other ones. As I said, there's it's definitely a meaty it, it, situation. It may be an RE2 level of bias. Um. <laughs> yeah, I know that feeling well. <laughs> I, I, do uh, think help, I do think it helps that it's easy. Again, with like when you read Caliban Cove and Underworld, it, it's easier on your mind because you know what these places oh, look yeah. like as you well. Can it's absolutely yeah. visualize it. Yeah, 100%. It's and, and when sort of like little changes come up, it's actually kind of pleasant in that way. You can sort of see it happening in the locations that you know so well. Um, Steve, you sort of alluded to there the uh, Ada sort of solving the puzzles and stuff, and she, there's a moment where she drops the plugs for Leon to find right by the doorway yeah. to use them. I love stuff like that, you know. Um, you know, and she said in an interview that I read that it, it, just because it helps it. Uh, from a book perspective, you don't want people just running back and forth through hallways in a book. It's not interesting to read. So it's interesting to see how she sort of like outsmarts the game uh, early on with Claire arriving at the RPD, uh, coming across the, the flaming wreckage of the helicopter instead of amassing two parts to make a bomb, combining them, then blowing it up. Yeah. She just finds a fire extinguisher and then kicks the door down. <laughs> Which I absolutely That's love. That's what Redfields do. Exactly. Uh, I yeah. mean, I love that. It really did make me laugh. Yeah. Um, 
The only thing, I think this is because we, we fall into like the super fan bracket and we know all these rooms and these areas off by heart. I would like to have known how it would have sat with people had they not the context for the game. Because I feel like, I don't know, sometimes it felt like that I got the general picture of the room, but I don't know what a, a uh, person who hadn't experienced RE2's impressions sure. of the RPD would be like. It feels almost very small, despite the descriptions of some of the things. I don't know, for some reason, the book version felt very compact for a police station. Or a, yes. the RPD. Yeah, there is... Uh, I don't think they even ever really go sort of on one side of the wing of the RPD. Not really. It might be briefly mentioned. But mo yeah, a lot of the rooms don't even get a look in. Um, you know, like the, the liquor corridor never comes up. I thought it was actually... Speaking of slight changes, I thought it was really funny that it, it appears like... It read to me that the sort of liquor experience that Claire has is in the hallway it, outside the star's office which is yes it you know, was yeah. <laughs> really yep. funny considering a remake 2 that's the uh, the location where you first encounter a liquor uh, just you know funny stuff like that mm -hmm. and uh, we were talking in the Caliban Cove episode um, about how you know you've got zombies in that book with guns and, and stuff like that and how at the time with so few, such little source material to go on, you could kind of understand why S.G. Perry uh, came to that conclusion. And you get a little bit of that here as well with the liquors um, being called RE3s, <laughs> which is a book exclusive term. But, it, you know, in hindsight, it does kind of make sense when that's the only experience you got and you don't have all these guidebooks and stuff like that. It kind of looks like a reptile. Well, the, the mammals are M A and Neptune is F I, so this thing must be R E for reptile. I can at least understand, and yep. I, you know, I like her guesswork. I, I find uh, her guesses interesting. Mm. So this book is also sometimes credited with the uh, incorrectly with first use of Mister X as well, which, which is uh, at least the, where the name was popularized for the the Western audience, I think, right? Because it's first printed on the action figure, which I don't yes. think everyone would have seen the action figure necessarily. Um, but the book, I imagine, perhaps got into more hands uh, and talk, got talked about a bit more uh, outside of the internet. So that's perhaps where the name Mr. X really started to spread. But it does, and I learned this. Uh, this is the first time in the Western version of the canon, if you like, that we got Marvin's surname, because it's never said in RE2, and I don't think it's mentioned in the manual or anything like that. But... Uh, Whilst it was Isn't already it? established, I, yeah, apparently so. It was established in Japan, probably in a guidebook, but this is the first time in English that it's actually written Marvin Branagh, I believe. So there you go. You get zero There's closure for him, though. I did not know that. Yeah. So there you go. <sighs> wow. Hot wow. knowledge. <laughs> see, Pe Perry's ahead of the game. You see, as I said, Mr. X has now semi been canonized, hasn't it? Mm. Resistance. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> a great canon. <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, dear. And then. <laughs> And the word liquor as well, oddly. Yeah. Mm. Um, but there we go. Yeah, so... Yeah, I, I, I've i never had a problem with Mr. X um, as a name. Um, it's... It's a, colloqu a kind of colloquial name, but... It, I suppose it, it, ma it makes sense in this because, of course, Claire and Neon wouldn't have a clue what it's called. So yes. it made perfect sense to call it right. Mr. X. To go, oh my God, it's a tyrant. The tyrant walked forward. Well, that, that wouldn't that wouldn't work within the context of what Leon and Claire are experiencing. Mm. So, yeah, I do. I agree exactly. Again, then she comes up with a good reason for something mm. like that, where Claire is just scrabbling for names. Uh, one of, <laughs> one of which she says is Dr. Evil, which is obviously again, yeah. in, in hindsight is a bit stupid now, but uh, yeah, you know, contextually it, it, it works. It's fine. Um, so speaking of, of Claire, let's talk about the characters, I guess. Um, Steve, any any standout, well written characters for you? I kind of liked a lot of them. Uh, you know, well, the principal four anyway. Uh, Annette was okay, as you could kind of get the feeling of her mind shattering as she's like falling and taking injuries and then taking mm. copious amounts of painkillers to you know supplant it. But I think the the, the the big takeaway for me was just Ada's internal struggles as she goes throughout this mission. It's, it's more believable for me than the actual game was where Leon and Ada start making out mm. before she dies. You know, the, the fact that there's a, a level of tension and mistrust, she's trying to find ways to lose him. I Yeah, I really enjoyed that. And especially, uh, again, uh, Claire and Sherry. You get to see what Sherry's mindset is. Mm. And uh, the, the fact that she's running away to try and keep Claire safe because Claire's the first nice person she's met is uh, it's kind of heartwarming. Yeah, I'd agree, no, yeah, I, I'd agree. I really liked Ada's uh, interactions. I liked her 
um, flashback. She had a couple of flashback scenes, didn't she, when she was in town earlier, um, talking, mm. you know, talking about what she was going to do, and you could you, the, the believability of her almost falling for Leon uh, was, was was there. And I think if you just played the game and then read this, that, that is exactly what adaptation should do. They get into people's minds. Uh, during particular scenes and circumstances, and I think that worked really well. Personally, for me, the highlight was Irons. I really <laughs> like what they did with Irons. Um, in the game, he's he's like he's slimy, isn't he? And he's a bit like um, you, you're unsure. In fact, when you, when you first meet him, you feel a bit sorry for him. He's obviously got this uh, affection towards um, the mayor's daughter. who as she guessed the name wrong, I think, in this book. Didn't she? Of course. Yeah. Um, but it's fine. It's not a problem. Uh, you know, and in the game, he's quite... Uh, he's, he's not a nice bloke, but he's, he's, he's certainly not the weird character he's in Remake 2, that over the top, mm. I, I, I'm clearly the baddie. This one, I think Perry got it halfway between the two, and I think that's to Brian Irons' um, you know, credit, really, in the way that he's handled. He can, When he interacts with Claire... Um, you know, he's got all his script from the game, but then he adds a bit more to it, and then you hear his internal wranglings, and he's absolutely paranoid about Umbrella taking him down, and he's convinced Claire is a spy for Umbrella. Um, she doesn't, you know, she doesn't. He doesn't believe her story about her being uh, Claire Redfield, despite looking a bit like Chris. Um, he's absolutely convinced that you know this is someone determined to take him out, and so when the moment comes when he is killed by Birkin and stuff, there's a bit more yeah to it because he is a bit he's a, he's a lot more uh, you know man not to say manic because that's not it's not he, he's not quite like that. he's still in control a bit because there's a lot of scenes where he go where he's kind of like coming to the end he's going right this is this is it the end is coming I'm just going to do my last. Yeah. Or are, whatever he wanted to do, um, but you, you get you you feel that um, that kind of uh, mad element, that paranoia, and that feeds into the atmosphere and the environment that he's in uh, with his kind of you know, taxidermy and stuff. And I don't know, I, I, I just felt a bit a bit more, um, you know, a bit more yes when he was when he was taken out. Yeah, he's a uh, he's definitely an interesting one, especially sort of his earlier chapters. Um, Perry really made him like truly schizophrenic early on because he sort of he's kind of thinking you know oh there's this body in my hands and she's looking at me and smiling at me and all this she, actually no she's dead already you know um, it's truly creepy I completely agree with both that and Steve what you were saying about both what, what, what both of you were saying about Ada you know um, renownedly I'm not the biggest Ada fan but <clears throat> I really liked this version of her i really like that story being told it's often it's funny because it's what people say you know when books get adapted to movies and other media people always go Psh, the book's better but you know books have that advantage of sort of letting you into a character's thoughts because as, as you said steve you know the, the the love story between them on game is, is you know it's difficult to slot it around a game whereas in the book yeah you get to have both of these sort of internal monologues of these characters um and she really does make it make a lot of sense and how they view each other. Um, and specifically, just how she, you know, writes Ada, I love. You know, there's one particularly brilliant line I had to write because uh, I just thought it was the most Ada thing, which is, if there's one thing Ada knew, it was men were easier to handle when they thought they were in control. I was like, man, that screams Ada from 98 to the present day. That, like, well done for, like, nailing that part of her character, definitely. Um also, Leon, separately, I really liked Leon straight from the off. You know, I felt like she understood who Leon was. Uh, I liked the way that she writes him as a kind of a daydreamer at the beginning. He's thinking about when he arrives in Raccoon City and he thinks something's up, but, he, you know, he doesn't know the full circumstances. He starts daydreaming about the being the big hero uh, of it and all this. Uh, I really like that. I could see I could see young Leon being like that before his, you know, world gets torn asunder by that night. Um and the justification he even gets a dumb one liner, doesn't he? Uh, at the end, uh, he takes out Birkin, and it's like, you know, I need a raise. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> exactly. And I also like the justification of his lateness in this uh, stuck in New York traffic that he hadn't planned for. It's like, yeah, you know, okay, that kind of works. That kind of works. So is Leon from New York in this continuity? In fact, is everyone from New York in this continuity? Because it feels <laughs> like it. I guess so. 
I guess so. Yeah. Mm. Is is it are the Red Fox from New York in this in the books as well? I know they are in certain tellings. I don't know if it was the Perry books or not. Um, I know Leon comes from New York. At least at he's, he's yeah. headed from New York. Ada is headed from New York. I'm assuming <laughs> right. you know Brian Irons came in from New York. <laughs> uh, ben Bertolucci flew in from New York. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. No, those last two aren't serious. But uh, it, it just seems very oddly. Uh, is that where it was meant to be placed in the like in the geographical map of the era? Is that mm. where they thought Raccoon City was? I think in like, the books, two steps it's... down below. Yeah, I think in the books it's Philadelphia, isn't it? Um, yeah. or, or at least, yeah, or, or rather, yeah. Pennsylvania. Mm. Yeah, in order to be stuck in traffic from New York suggests you are relatively close. Um, yeah. For it to have made a long drive. Impact. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and of course, the caravan's in Maine, isn't it? Up That's right. Yeah. Northeast, yeah. The other line that I had to write down that I really like for characterization, and it's not even a character who's really in the book, um, but also at the beginning where Claire is searching for chris and she decides to head to emmy's diner in search of him because it's a popular spot for him to go because and i quote chris can't cook worth a damn and i was like i love that i bet he can't of course he can't chris redville can't cook you know he can't do the simple math to make the v jolt mixing so i imagine he doesn't even know how to make spaghetti bolognese so i I just thought that's such a that is such a nail on the head chris thing Well, well done to her i love that Claire aimed but hesitated, terrified of making a horrible mistake, until it took one massive step forward on tree trunk legs, and she heard the crunch of denting wood beneath its booted Frankenstein feet, and saw the black eyes, black and rimmed with red, like lava-filled pits in a misshapen white boulder, blank but not at all blind. His gaze found hers, and he raised one meaty clenched fist, the threat unmistakable. Shoot, shoot, shoot. She squeezed the trigger one, two times and saw the impact. A flap of its lapel blew into shreds just below his collarbone, and the second shot slicing cleanly through one side of the neck. And he took another step, not a flicker of expression passing over his rough-hewn features, the fist still raised seeking a target, seeking to crush. The black smoking hole in its throat wasn't bleeding. In a rush of adrenaline-boosted dread, Claire pointed the handgun at the creature's heart and pulled the trigger repeatedly, the giant taking another step, striding into the stream of explosive fire without flinching. And she lost track of the shots, unable to believe that it could still be coming, less than ten feet away as the rounds hammered its mammoth chest. And the gun clicked empty even as the monster stopped in its thundering tracks, swaying from side to side like a tall building in a high wind. Without taking her shocked gaze from the reeling giant, Claire grabbed another clip from her vest and fumbled through reloading, her brain crazily trying to name this walking abortion. Terminator, Frankenstein's monster, Dr. Evil, Mr. X. Whatever it was supposed to be, the seven plus semi-jacketed rounds to the chest had finally taken effect. Silently, the towering creature slumped to his right falling heavily against one smoke-blackened wall and sagging there, not crumpling, but not moving either. Uh, Speaking of quoting lines, let's talk about S.T. Perry's writing style. I've always been of the opinion that she's a very competent writer. You know, she won't be winning any uh, major awards, but she's never really let me down. I never read anything was like, well, that was really poorly written. You know, she's got some issues with weaponry and she's she's faced that in the intervening years that she didn't understand the difference between a, a clip and, and, and stuff like that. Uh, in this book in particular, <laughs> there's a moment where she claims that the Remington shotgun is more powerful than the Magnum. I don't know what game she was playing, but that's not the <laughs> game that I was playing. Um, Steve, what do you think of the, the writing style in this? I did, uh, you know, the, the fact that we go from so many perspectives, it feels like there's a massive swivel because there's so many like principal cast members this time. That yeah, compared to Caliban Cove, I really enjoyed it. It was nice because I could get the distinct feeling of each character's own head when she was writing them, and they're like in a monologue, especially like Brian and his, you know, almost Norman Bates esque mm. schizophrenia meltdown. And yeah, like I said, for the, I think Ada is done spectacularly in this. I think all of them really. I, um, I, I, when she's writing inside a character's mind, 
I genuinely enjoy. I do feel like, like I said earlier, the what the locations. I feel like because we have the context of obviously playing these games, we're we're riding it a bit easy. I yeah. uh, sometimes it feels like the the locations could use a bit of work. The geography gets a bit I, weird in my know, head. I hadn't thought about it, but you, you you're right. I definitely agree with that. Mm. Uh, but that, that, you know, that aside, the, the the actual characters and stuff like that, I really enjoyed it. Uh, I had no real complaints. I liked some of the tweaks to what things that happen, like the, the throwdown with Mr. X is now more, he's trying to punch in the back of the train to get at Birkin 5, basically, who's on the train already, but they don't know that. Mm. And Claire gets in the way. Or at least it feels that way. And, uh, you know, takedowns of a tyrant with a heavy machine gun aside, it was okay. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, you know I the descriptions know of gore and violence was strong in this one, I thought. that The actual gore... Oh, right. She writes. Interesting, because I, I, you know, I've said it in previous episodes, and I'm sure I'll say it again, um, but I, yeah, I think her gore writing is good. For this one, I'd, maybe there's not as much as it. That's why it didn't stand out too much to me. Maybe it just seemed a little bit less of it, but it didn't stand out as much as the last two books. But yeah, some of her uh, general writing's really good. There's a moment where she describes a, zomb- a zombie as graceless yet silent, which I thought was quite inspired. Um <laughs> And, and know, even talk- Misty gets a shout out, doesn't she? Absolutely, Under yeah. A that's, new why, name. that's why she's on the cover. Yeah, they definitely <laughs> particularly pointed out Misty, which I thought was nice. Yeah. I love just stuff like that that she does is great. You know, explanations for small things as well. Claire's lack of decent bike clothing is because her roommate borrowed them, and then Claire has panicked about Chris and and just jumped on a bike, uh, which I thought was you know. Perry looking at silly things and then at least trying to come up with a reason for them and not just accepting it, which is which is kind of cool. Um, Nick, what do you think of the the writing style of S.D. Perry in this book and in general? I guess. I, I as I said earlier, I think I think it is right when it is an adaptation, you give it, it's easier on your mind because mm. you know what she's describing. It doesn't take a lot to work out. Oh, this is the West Office or this is the Stars Office, and you know it's you you can just visualize it. So I always found reading the original novels a lot more say challenging in that sense um and i think that they're the better examples to see where perhaps some of the writing is a bit su- not su- i say subpar it's not that's not true i you know it's perfectly readable i thought her descriptions of like the liquors were very good mm. um, they sounded very gruesome in the way that she described them um it, it, the inside out men i think was the term that yes, <laughs> they were kind of used right. throughout there and that's true isn't it you know the fact that you can see the brains and all the muscles and the kind of the sinew and things like that it's it's a perfect description of it and um yeah the you got that feeling didn't you and it's certainly true in the first book about the you know the, the smell and the Mm. The, the rancid nature of, 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 the, of the zombies. And I, I thought it was fine. I thought, it, I, you know, I thought the, the kind of BOW element worked very well. Uh, Mr. X is written very imposingly. Mm. Um, you know, you, the kind of desperation that they that she writes when they shoot her, you know, she'll do it quite quickly. Like one, two, three, bam, 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 like that. Mm. You know, then it's like bam, 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 no effect. That kind of, you know, that kind of element. It yeah. really uh, it gives that impression that you're up against some formidable you know machine which of course you are um then uh i think birkin was i think birkin was p- possibly the weakest the way it's described i think it is hard to describe in writing um mm. i think there's some i think leon takes some time to talk about him on the tram yes uh, the transformation the, the kind of, yeah yeah again you, you give it a slight free pass because you know mm. you know what it is you, you, can, you can visualize it because you know the artwork, you know the style. Whether it, whether it's harder for non gamers uh, to to understand, I, it's hard. It's impossible for us to to decide um, because we know. Mm. But I think I think I, yeah, I wasn't entirely convinced that Birkin was best described in this one compared to the others. But uh, it, as I said, it certainly wasn't um, problematic reading it, um, and I you know I was. I said it's been such a long time since I've read these. I was actually pleasantly surprised about how well it was written, because um, you, you just get ingrained with the idea that they're rubbish. Because that's what, <laughs> that's what that right. is what has been. You, you do, you do, because you know that's what's been said for so long about. And it's as I said, it's only kind of recently there's been this bit of a renaissance with 
these books. I think I uh, when I when you asked me to come on here, I, I posted a tweet going, "Look what I'm reading," mm. you know, on Twitter. It, it took off. And I was like, "Yes, it's a great book," and I was like, "Is it? I can't remember." <laughs> and uh, yeah. it, honestly, it was well, probably at least 15 years ago. Um, and as I said, it was you know, it's a, it was a nice, enjoyable read. And um, I, I, I read so much now. Uh, in science fiction and Star Wars, so I, you know, I, I read and embrace all different styles. Mm. Um, you know, we sp- spoke about earlier in the in the news about the the young adult live action Resident Evil. Well, I read a load of young adult Star Wars books, and mm. I find them perfectly readable and enjoyable. And I think this falls into the same sort of bracket in terms of uh, writing style. It's different, but it works. Yes, absolutely. I completely agree with what you're saying about how she's good at sort of setting the right mood at certain points, like the Mr. X. Yeah. It does feel imposing. That final uh, boss fight with the T-103 feels very tense. Um, one other scene that stood out is the this helicopter crash. It feels even cooler in the book than it is in the game, the way that she describes sort of like the yeah. sort of the light on the helicopter flying around the rooftop and stuff like that. I was, I mean, yeah, I was very into that. Um with Birkin, and this is sort of like moving into the next section as well, um, I think, yeah, it's difficult to describe him, but my issue, and also why maybe he shouldn't be on the front cover for me, is that I felt like his presence in this book was very limited. Um, and I know RE2 is very complicated. I understand that. That's why we've got such a hefty book. She did a fantastic job, as we've all said, uh, of putting that story on the page. But he's hardly in the book. You know, in the game, you the game sort of feels like you are feeling this looming presence of Birkin the entire time. Not just the monster, but the man and what he's done and his goals and his paranoia. It's always in the background. It's, you know, it's a big part of why everything's happened. Um, yeah. Whereas in the book, not so much. He's Sherry's monster who sort of shows up for a fight on the train car. Uh, when Leon defeated him, I thought he was going to scrabbling away because he'd uh, sensed Sherry or something, and then Claire was going to have a fight with him, but not so much. And then at the end, yeah, he's, he's G5. But I would have liked to have seen a bit more of him, I suppose, but I, then then the problem is at the sort of like, what do you take out? You know, how, how do you fit that in? How does that, How's that all going to slot together when there's so many other moving parts? Um, you know, RE2 has two two recurring stalking sort of boss enemies. So one does need to sort of take a bit more of a backseat, but I don't know. For me, this the RE2 story is very much about Birkin and the family, the, you know, the Birkin family. So out of the two, I would have gone that way. But, you know, again, maybe that's a little bit of hindsight. Let's talk about, though, uh, in general, how it feels about uh, as, as, a, as an adaption of the game. Um, Nick, how do you feel about uh what the the changes from the game to the book anything that stood out that you thought was really good or really bad or just just different in an interesting way um it's 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 with re2 because there's so many different variables isn't there even in the official canon it's like is it is it claire a leon b um well you know bits of bits of claire b are used uh, Mm. in some storyline so you know she picked she picked a perfectly viable choice should we say um it misses out obviously a lot of the g infection um storyline with sherry but then on the other side we get the cool scene with ada and leon uh Mm. dangling over the edge um you know that so this is what everyone's dying for kind of moment this is slightly retweaked in the book i think but it's you know it builds up and i think annette gets a good amount of description you know mm. I think there's, a, there's a bit where she goes and she fell asleep thinking about william you know dreaming about william or something like that and it's like it that helps and i think that's kind of like repeated again in remake two where annette gets a much bigger starring role um so again she's you know p- pushing pushing different characters which are later then kind of followed up so um you know, you could you could easily argue it's a it's a perfect adaptation of the material at the time. Um, it it covers all the basics, all the basics and the basis of Leon A. Claire B. Um, it it continues on from the storyline of um, Umbrella Conspiracy. It carries mm. on with Trent, you know, which is fine. And so, it, it, you know, if you follow the Trent storyline up to because um, obviously with, you want to probably read Resident Evil Three next as opposed to. 
um, Underworld, by the way, <laughs> for your next Oh, one. really? Yeah, because, although Nemesis is book five, um, Underworld takes place post. You probably <laughs> want to do un- Underworld last. You oh, want to okay. Do, you want to do Nemesis. Mm. Well, you might want to go back and do Zero, actually. <laughs> do zero. <laughs> <laughs> Nemesis came rocket. Underworld's the last one. I think, right, okay. If memory serves me correctly, so you might want to save that one. But um, yeah, so you know, it carries on with a kind of Trent storyline, and I, I remember reading again. I, I, I was quite heavily invested in what Trent was going to pull off because um, you know it could have happened in those in the games at some point. So I. I I, I struggled to fault it. I really did. I and um, I, 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 as I said earlier, I, I was surprised by it. I was surprised by the fact that I enjoyed it as much as I did. Um, and so I, I just like the addition of the that an adaptation can bring, such as you know the the, the thoughts of um, Ada and um, yeah, Annette, Brian right? in particular. Yeah, mm. Ben it's... was okay. Ben was okay. Yeah, um, he uh, he didn't <laughs> get. <laughs> get jobbed off quite as bad as poor Kendo did. You know, he didn't even get a word in. <laughs> he's he's dead when, yeah. you know, when we find him in the book. Uh, yeah, uh, so yeah. Because he got, he was the G embryo death, wasn't he? That was, that was, that's what I wanted to mention. The G embryo was good. Actually, the ba- baby G, whatever you want to call them, mm. the G adult. Uh, I like that. That was, that was gruesome. And that was well, that was well scripted, actually. So, yeah, I said, I the, the overall adaptation, I said bordering on perfect mm. um, of of the of of the actual material on screen, should we say? Whether a better book could have been produced, that's that's possible. You can easily you can easily expand upon it even more if you wanted to. But that is the benefit of hindsight. That's the benefit of you know another twenty odd years of games that you could add to it. You know, where's Kevin Ryman? Right. You, know, <laughs> exactly. you know, all sorts, all sorts. That's but right. you've got to kind of take it back to where it was at that particular point. She kept true to the script. She kept true to the ideas of Leon A. Claire B. And added just a little sprinkle of her things, of her mm. little ideas with Trent and um, David Trapp and the others. And for me, that worked wonderfully well. And you know what? If someone wants to have that in the have City of the Dead in particular in their head canon, why not? Why not? <laughs> Replace Trent with Wesker. You're, you're kosher. You're exactly. Kosher. Um, yeah. I think, speaking of Annette particularly, um, there's quite a lot of different perspectives in this book, to be honest. Claire, Leon, mm. Sherry, Ada, Irons, Annette. I think there might be all of them. There might even be another one, for, but it's it's quite a lot. Um, I was surprised by the Annette one, and pleasantly surprised, in fact. Um, I, In the original RE2, to me, I don't know, it, it doesn't feel like she's necessarily trying to stop G. I never necessarily got that impression. It feels like she's just kind of watching what happens. But in this, she, like, she has a very defined goal of, I'm going to make sure yeah. he's in the lab uh, and blow to the blow, lab to, to hell up. Yeah. Mm, yeah. so that no one can get the virus. And I really like that idea. As you said, she's sort of like, the grief of what's happened has become vengeance. That's driving her and she starts losing it. She starts dosing herself up to deal with some of the injuries that she goes through as well. I, I thought that was very strong. Um, in the grand scheme of things, her and Ian sort of blur together a little bit by the end because they wind up both being insane, paranoid nut jobs driven by rage uh, and, and the belief that Umbrella has betrayed them, which is a bit of a shame. But that being said, the writing was strong in general. Um, Steve, how do you feel about this book as an adaption of RE2? Pretty much what everyone else has said. It's a strong... It's not. I, I would argue there's, there's moments that I would have liked to have seen. Like, you know, for example, full full circular closure on Marvin. Mm-hmm. Seeing a character that we've established and talked to fall apart and then you have to shoot them, that kind of thing. Uh, we The truck driver kind of just appears from nowhere to ram <laughs> the car. Yeah. Yes, he does. You know, yeah. There's not even a whitey bite me or anything like that. <laughs> uh, you know... But it's yeah no I, I, I it's the first book for this for this book club that I've read multiple times in preparation for and uh, that's probably a good sign I again it could be my guesses but if you enjoyed RE2 as a whole and never want and, and wanted to see an A to C campaign this is the closest you're probably going to get <laughs> you know um, and I, yeah there are things that bother me like for example Birkin as my uh, my colleagues on the podcast have uh, rightly said kind of downplayed his final his final encounter it feels like he might as well have been a giant football with an eye on and leon just pops it 
<laughs> like, yeah, it, it, it's, it's kind of like luster compared to the whole, oh, God, the train car. We need to de- you know, detach it and explode it or let him, like, you know, overcome it and get blown up. There's none of that. It's kind of anticlimactic. You just shoot him, he deflates, he dies, and Birkin is gone. And Sherry will never know what happened to her mother or her father because the you know, the adults are talking and they're determined to issue around the issue. Mm. I do like that they, they actually give a bit more closure as well to how they get out of the city because that's something I've always wanted to see. I want to see them get picked up by the military or something. And the fact that it's just conveniently, you know, Rebecca and David just happened to be driving down the right road at the right <laughs> time. Yeah, but yeah, all in all, fun times. Sometimes. Yeah. Uh, is it the best book in the series? We haven't read them all yet, so... <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know. Part of me still wants to, like... I had a lot of fun with Caliban Cove, and I had a lot of fun with Umbrella Conspiracy, but my RE2 biases are throwing me for a ringer, and I... Yeah, I, I had a really good time with this one. Mm. The well, code, just as a sport, from my point of view, the, the Code Veronica one's pretty good as well, actually. I'm excited to read that one. I yeah. definitely am. Yeah. I think, I think you'll enjoy that one. I think that's quite faithful as well um, mm. I think it's, it's, yeah, uh, not bad. I, yeah I, I agree in terms of like an adaption RE2 if you're an RE2 fan you should definitely give it a go um, it's it's another way to experience that story without playing the game and there ain't nothing wrong with playing the game a hundred times we've all done it but it's interesting to, to sort of see this take on it um, unless I mean have you taken into account that there's no moth in it then maybe I guess it goes in the bin because that's a <laughs> that's a that's a sore spot yeah no ivies and no moth you know what again that's that's the case of it, as we say things do need to get cut around um and those things make sense of course it's just it would have been it's remake two again isn't it obviously the, the, obviously the, the capcom red sd perry uh, right they didn't do that. yeah they didn't replay the game they just read the book and went right okay we got the idea <laughs> No um, mesh monkeys, no MA twos, you know. <laughs> so let's, uh, yeah, let's quickly before we get to sort of final thoughts, how it feels as part of the series, um, particularly myself and Steve, having read the three books um, within the last year and a half, um, how it feels as part of the series up to this point. Um, for me, it's it, it's weird because after Caliban Cove, it's it's odd to read something that's so true to the source material. Not that I had a problem with Caliban Cove doing its own thing. Absolutely not. I enjoyed that book, definitely. Um, but this, out of the three of them, is definitely the closest. It's closer than Umbrella Conspiracy Theory, I'm, I'm pretty sure. Umbrella Conspiracy Theory, yeah, let's call it that. Because um, it has the least Trent mentions, and when they are, it's yeah, just a mention and, and not much else. Until the epilogue, as, uh, as Neptune said. Um, this is definitely the truest one of the three. Um, and as, as as you guys have said, you can see the game in your heads. That definitely helps in terms of making it feel even truer to the series. With Cadillac and Cove, it's, you've got to do a lot more imagination. Um, yeah, it's it fits. It, no, it fits nicely. I do like them. You know, for what it's worth, I do like the mentions. It, it keeps it part of that series. So it's kind of a 50-50 thing because it's nice because it's like, oh, it's Atari 2 with a couple of you know, extra bits thrown in, but not really hugely impactful. Um, but they're good that they're there. Even the small stuff, as Nick said, with the, the mayor's daughter's name, uh, not not that we knew it uh, at the time as fans being wrong, but at least she gave her the surname of the mayor that she gave in book one, which is kind of yes. cool. Yeah, so, I, you know, I like stuff like that. Um, for me, I'm more excited to read books that are truer to the game i'm excited to read nemesis more than i am underworld after reading this i'm excited to see how she adapts that game but overall i'm still up for underworld and interested to see where some of these other story strands go uh steve what do you think of it uh in terms of the wider scope of the series at, at least so far like i would touch on it feels the most standalone like you could take the prologue and epilogue you know mm. rip out trent put in wesker and it's like it's just the game you know that there is no like sd perryverse stuff not really uh and you know if you're really against that then that this is the one for you but right. uh, you know I, i'm still i'm still curious to where it go i, I want to having forgotten mostly what happens in these books i am for some reason the prologue is the bit that's still like eating up my brain and trying to figure out what happens to jill then she's leaving with chris and barry right now <laughs> how the hell is she gonna get stuck in you know yeah what? Uh, spoiler, spoilers, yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's so, the, uh, uh, yeah. Oh, go ahead. To, yeah, I mean, for me, Caliban's my favourite of the original novels. Oh, right, interesting. Uh, 
There's only two, obviously. So it's not, you know, it's not. Um, I, I might, I like, I liked that um, more so than um, Underworld. Okay. Um, you're right. City of the Dead is very much standalone. I, I think it works quite nicely with um, Umbrella Conspiracy. The we, uh, the problems go on because uh, with like Nemesis, for example, there's there's a disclaimer at the beginning of the book. Mm. Um, so that will that's the kind of spoiler element. You know, she doesn't even try because it's impossible. So she just does her best. So you know, there's there's going to be clear contradictions um, with what's already established within these books. Dang. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> no, um, it's fine. Out. <laughs> You would have remembered. Yeah. So it's, it you know, they they just pretend that Jill, you know, was always in the city. That kind of you know that mm-hmm. kind of thing. So um, and so in, so when you so you've got to kind of then evaluate that when when judging City of the Dead because then as Steve said it it does still fit quite nicely. Mm. It, mm. It's the other titles that kind of then become a bit more problematic and where it's all going. I don't think it's as bad as I, people thought it was. Um, but yeah, you, you'll notice it when you read Nemesis. You'll be like, okay, fine, fine. Um, but I like it. Yeah, I, I think it. I think it's a, a very solid entry in 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 her, in her series. It's probably. I'm just trying to think. Oh, it's, it's such a long time ago. Um, I remember enjoying it more, perhaps than Zero. And well, I say Cove Veronica is very good, but I think I enjoyed Sit the Dead a bit more than Cove Veronica. Oh, so it, it, yeah, I think so. I, I'm just trying, trying to remember. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's probably one of the best, if not the best, of the um, of the adaptations. But then it's you know because you've got the visual elements, it, I, I think that helps enormously. So. Mm. Uh, Steve, final thoughts on City of the Dead? Then where does it was it ranked? Best one out of the lot so far? I'm guessing from. From your multiple yeah, yeah, massive caveats aside, like you know, as a standalone RE2 adaption, it's pretty strong. And you know, if you want to know the wider scope of the Periverse, it's almost skippable, which is weird when you put it that way. Mm. Like, you, if you want to know the entire ins and outs, if you know what RE2 is, you could you could read the front chapter, you could read the back chapter, and you're good to go for the rest of the books. As, <laughs> as much as Canon's going to get shattered to bits by the sounds of it, uh, you know. <laughs> Because it mostly is just RE2. And if you're here for more RE2 and nothing else, that's fantastic. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm that's the one thing I enjoy most about these book club episodes is just seeing where this this pocket universe goes, even if it's going to shatter on itself before we get to, like, episode five. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, as a, as a person who is a mostly functioning human being who can read, it, <laughs> the, the fact that I've gone through this book multiple times in preparation for this podcast probably says a lot, like, yeah. like we've already said. And it's fairly pacey. I didn't have any issues with it, and I didn't get bored, which happened a few times during some of the others. Oh, okay. Not not so much to write them off, obviously, because I still enjoyed them well enough. So yeah, if you're a fan of RE2, go for it. That's mm. my final verdict, really. If you're invested in the SD Periverse law, just read a synopsis and move on. Mm. I uh, it's the nature of the beast with these writing these books before the games come out and stuff like that, isn't it? That the canon is going to get have these things. I mean, even just the prologue in this book almost seems like it's it's there to tie up from Caravan Cove, where the other stars members have decided they're going to hunker down low in I think like Brad's apartment or something. Um, so you know she's constantly trying to write herself out of a hole uh, because what she's written previously. Uh, that she's written for the purpose of sort of adding some more flavour to what's going on with the other characters, then suddenly doesn't match up with the games that she has to write about. So just the way it goes, again, with us sort of talking about these in hindsight, it makes it a hell of a lot easier. If we were, you know, reviewing these as they came out, uh, I imagine it would have been frustrating to be like, well, no, this doesn't fit all fit together. Um, but, you know, now that everything's out and it is the way it is, and almost certainly we're not going to suddenly get a new S.D. Perry novel, um, we can read them in sort of isolation like that. Um, Nick, you've, you've oh, no. pretty much... Don't say that. <laughs> Don't say that. I want to hear, I want to hear SD Perry's take on Ethan. <laughs> just just jump straight <laughs> to village. Uh, Nick, you already, uh, you pretty much said it. City of the Dead is might be the number one pick of the lot for you. I think so. I, just, I, can't, I can't entirely uh, qualify that because it's been a lot. Yeah, sure. Time since I've read the others, but... Um... I don't remember being quite as enthralled with the others than I was with this one, put mm. it that way. Um, 
they're all good. They're all good. I said the Code Veronica one. I distinctly remember. I spent a long time reading that. Not not because it was dragging, but because I was trying to take in as much because it was the game I was familiar the least with when I read it. Um, right. Because it, so I was like trying to absorb as much from the book just to kind of help me with the game as well. Um, but yeah, this one um, I, I think is probably the best um, out of the out of the original out of all the kind of adaptations that she did. Um, it work the the A B scenarios actually probably works a bit better because there's clear defined paths. Mm. Whereas in Umbrella Conspiracy, the, the games are near identical, aren't they? Depending on which route you take. So um, it this one she could just go right. I'm doing Leon A Claire B and, and, right. and the, a lot a lot of the interconnectivity um, has done, was done for her. Whereas in Umbrella Conspiracy, she kind of had to mesh it around a bit herself, um, you mm. know, to make it work. So this was this made it a bit easier for her. Yeah, uh, but you know, for me, I actually quite like, kind of like to see uh, how she handled RE one and where she took the characters and to try and avoid, oh, yeah, yeah. almost you know to avoid them bumping into each other. I think out of them uh, that I still might like the first book just a little bit more. And I think <laughs> to be perfectly honest, it's it might be a length thing as well. It's like this is. Arduous is a very strong word. I did, I've, I absolutely, you know, I, re, I thought it was really good. I did enjoy it. It's a little long though, um, and it's very, it's very cleverly made. But I just like it's as long as it had to be, you know, you're any shorter and you're gonna, it's, it's gonna have problems if you start chopping stuff out. It, it had to be this long. But I, I just maybe it was just the punchiness of the first two books. I really, really enjoyed. Like I could have read them and picked them up a second time quite easy with this one being over 300 pages i was like i'd have to give it a little bit before i pick it up again certainly that being said yeah it's a really good adaption of re2 it's a fine addition to this ongoing series like not to completely overshadow that did, 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 did the spencer mansion feel like a lot more populated than the rpd and sewers and everything else was because it certainly feels like it yeah i think so because again, it's I, I think that's a case of there is more story to tell in RE2, like moment to moment, so it's less bogged down in like action scenes. Uh, they you, never found they came, you never found they came across a lot of, Yeah, you never found they came across a lot of zombies. It was like mm. we're now in the sewers. Here's a spider. We're now we're now in the labs. Here's some more RE3s as they called them. Yeah, um, you, the, the zombies wasn't as perhaps a constant threat. Right, uh, and, but again, it's it's the, just this case of writing a book, isn't it? How many times can you course. write? And then some zombies came out, and we shot them. You know, it's not that exciting. And blasted them yeah. with his fifty caliber Desert Eagle. His dad and granddad got him. That's as right. Graduation <laughs> present. My God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, and the other thing I find is also just sort of, and you just kind of have to just sort of go, okay, sure. Is most of these encounters, whilst they can be written quite tensely, uh, not many enemies land a single hit on any of the characters just because of the nature of infection. Whereas video games is video games. Whereas this, usually it's describe the monster, fill it full of lead, move on. <laughs> That's just the way it goes. Well, nothing else remains for me but to thank our contributors. If you'd like to be part of the show, then please look into auditioning for our file readings. Join the Discord server to get in touch with members of the team and our community, discuss Resident Evil with us and other fans, and listen to the podcast live as it's being recorded. You can find a link to the server, as well as our Twitter, Facebook, Twitch, Instagram, YouTube, and more at fasprayPod.com. You can find the podcast on YouTube, Stitcher, Spotify, and iTunes, and if you enjoyed the show, please do leave us a review where you can. It helps spread the word. You can also support the show by picking up some merch or at patreon.com forward slash fa spray pod for as little as one dollar a month in our next episode we uh there's no easy way of saying it i'm dragging Stephen james kicking and screaming into playing an infamous re title because not every game that we cover can be a stone cold classic it's time for umbrella core Thank you to the panel. You can follow all of the Pueblo people individually. I'm at Siniac underscore one, two, three. Steve is at FB Steve was taken. And Neptune is at RE underscore Neptune. And finally, thank you for listening and have a good week. Entertain, entertain the listeners with some anecdotes from yes from yesteryear. I don't know.
I've got, I haven't got any off the top of my head. But, um, and we can all talk about how great Resident Evil Gaiden is. There yes. <laughs> yeah, do you know what? We need to put you and Sherwin Matthews in, our, in a room. He's uh, <laughs> He loves that game. It's great, is it? Is it? No, it's 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 a semi decent game. It's a good game, and um, one day, <laughs> one day, as I said, you know, we've recently found out that Gaiden is directly referenced in Resident Evil Four. So you know, whatever, well, <laughs> very much. Can. Mm, that'll be in the remake as well, just to make it to make sure. Well, every yeah. time, every time Leon gets announced for a new thing, I'm waiting for the. Oh, this is just like the Starlight, and then every you know, could you imagine? <laughs> can you imagine? <laughs> Can you imagine what would happen in the community if that happened? <laughs> the ripples. The thing is, though, the thing is about Gaiden is that the whole game following Village has now been completely remade. Every element of Gaiden is now remade in some capacity. So you've got the, the cruise ship, mm-hmm. done. Yeah. Um, the the amoeba tyrant is basically an ooze, like something that can... You know, yeah. disintegrating. You know that that's all done. Mm-hmm. Uh, special uh, young special girl with powers, Natalia, Lucia, done. And then to finish it all off, we had shapeshifting, which was done in Village with the with the parasite BOW. Mm-hmm. So well, the whole game yeah. has been done. We don't have a gas launcher yet. <laughs> <laughs> Cap- Veronica got the gas rounds. Oh, the well, I suppose that's. Mm. <laughs> I'll take it. But well, I like my, my my theory is good, and uh, whilst there's people here, people will 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 endure my theory that it's not a sh- it's not a fake Leon at the end. It's just an infected Leon at the end. It makes Sh- sense. It, it makes, I've read you. I've read your account. Yeah, yeah. it makes sense. <laughs> they're, 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 it's a good theory. It's a good theory. 